Welcome back to Plenary Session. That's your favorite oncology podcast. It's got to be your favorite because we're the most popular one globally. Today I'm talking about Karma 3. This is Idacel or standard regimens in relapse and refractory multiple myeloma. This was the talk of the town just a couple weeks ago. People are still talking about it, to be honest. The study has got some problems with it. It's got some problems with it. It's got a lot of problems, and I'm going to walk you through some of the biggest problems I see, but also some of the deeper philosophical problems. It is fitting that this is called karma, which uh, is the sum of one's actions in this life, which determines your fate in a future life, because I think the myeloma field doesn't realize that they have bad karma. I mean, they're promoting products relentlessly with very little understanding of when and how to give these products to maximize patient outcomes, but a lot of understanding about how to give these products to maximize profit outcomes. That seems to be what they care about. Let's take a look at Ida Seller's standard regimens and relapse refractory myel- myeloma. First, we thank the patients and their families for making this trial possible. The clinical trial teams, and of course, Simon, whatever your name is, for assistance in preparing an earlier version. Of course, it's a medical writer. God forbid you write your own New England Journal of Medicine article. God forbid you write it. You've got to have somebody prepare it for you. I think this is terrible. If somebody is helping you write the paper, it shouldn't be on your CV. You shouldn't get promoted for it. This is something that needs to be fixed. And if you think it's acceptable, people always make the excuse, well, that's no different than the status. If you think it's acceptable, then why not let the students do it in high school or college or even grade school, they can get their medical writer. Well, it turns out that you won't like that so much because writing is the expression of thought. If the PI cannot write their own manuscript, they're not qualified to be the PI. They need to go back to basic school and learn how to be a writer, how to formulate your thoughts and put pen to paper. So I disagree with this. This is the the takeaway figure, look at that, hazard ratio, 0.49. Such a good hazard ratio, people. What a good hazard ratio. Of course, a unitless, dimensionless, constructless value that has no meaning for patients or doctors. It's what people like to talk about. I don't like to look at hazard ratios. But even then, looking at the PFS, it's a pretty big median PFS, isn't it? Maybe it's about eight, nine months. Median PFS on standard regimens, it's a roller coaster ride. I mean, that PFS curve is precipitously falling. Whereas with Idacel, it's 13 months. The key takeaway here is look at the tail of the Idacel curve. How many people are cured with Idacel and cellular therapy and myeloma? And that's right, it's 0% because there is no such thing as cure in myeloma. I know some people like to use that word but they're using it incorrectly and they're creating a false promise. In fact, to some degree, it is a false advertisement because the more they use the word, the more they get the referrals from the wealthy patients who seek a cure. After all, who wouldn't want a cure if it exists? I would want a cure if it exists. But they use that word, they don't have evidence for that word, and it's really sort of predatory. I mean, it is a predatory practice to misuse the word cure. This is not curing anybody. Every single person who gets a cellular therapy is gonna relapse. That means the price shouldn't be $400,000. You know, it should be something much lower because it is not a durable treatment. It's different than the B-cell lymphomas, tisogenic leucal. It's different than pediatric ALL. This is not curative. But there's something about that standard curve that I don't like. You know, it's really abrupt. I mean, hmm. It's also two to one randomization. We're gonna talk about that. Um, But this is the takeaway. When this study was launched, where was Idacel already FDA approved? It was FDA approved for people with four prior lines of therapy. This enrolls people who are triple class exposed to two to four prior lines of therapy. It's a little bit before the FDA approval. Once we have it approved, what's the question that the doctor and patient wants to know? Once you have it approved and once you believe in it, that it actually has a role to play, which I think the majority of people in myeloma believe it had a role to play. We'll talk more at the end about that. But they believe it has a role to play. I mean, people think it generates responses. It's a useful product. It's already approved after four. What you want in the next study is a trial that compares giving it earlier to giving it after four. I mean, both arms should get it. The question is, where's the right place to put it in sequence? For that, PFS doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? If you want to know the best place to sequence a therapy, you don't really care what progression-free survival is on that therapy because it might be better now. But if I give the standard regimen arm 
IDASL later, what's the combo PFS standard plus IDASL or IDASL plus standard? Is it the same? And if it's the same, then isn't it a wash? Can't I just give it an easier order? And what about OS? Does giving it earlier actually improve OS? There's one thing that giving it earlier will do. It's improve the bank account of the sponsor because more people are going to get it. The sooner you give it, the more people are going to get it, the more money they're going to make. But that's not even philosophically the right question. We're already giving this four prior lines of therapy, and we want to know about moving it up. Actually, it was even a little bit dirtier than that, wasn't it? Because it was very hard to get. They were running this study, unnecessarily large, as we'll point out, because it got two to one randomization. They were running lots of studies. They're studying this all over the place. There are even some people so crazy, they want to give a car to smoldering. Meanwhile, people with relapse, refractory, four-line myeloma, they're dying without access to CAR-T because the wait lists were so long. So they were taking all their manufacturing capacity and trying to move it up front. Meanwhile, they were neglecting the patients who were dying while the trial was running. I think that's pretty bad. Now, of course, the world is different because we got teclistimab. And teclistimab has the advantage that you don't have to wait for somebody to make it. And so it's going to eat up all of this market share. I'm pretty sure all the bites are going to eat up the market share. Why do I want a CAR T that's non curative when I can have a bite that's also non curative, but at least I don't got to wait for you to make it and put me on some big wait list while you run your trials in MGUS and smoldering? Well, not MGUS, thank God, but you know, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but not far from the truth. They really are relentlessly pursuing a market share that they can't deliver upon because they're not delivering upon the market share in the relapse refractory setting. Okay, so prior to this study, four and over, you could get it. This study is testing two to four versus standard care. Standard care, the best care you'd give somebody outside of the trial, right? Right? Not, not right, actually. Once again, we have a physician's choice, standard of care. That's not really a unfettered choice. You know, every once in a while I get invited to a restaurant and somebody's like, I'm going to take you to this restaurant. And they take you to a side room and they don't actually let you order from the menu. You order from a tiny menu where they've removed all the things you actually want to eat. And that's like this. The control arm had to be one of the following. Darapomd, Darabortezomib Dex, Ixalendex. Oh, Ixalendex. That great regimen of Ixalendex. We'll come to that. KD, Elopomd. Well, what about KPD? You're not allowed to give KPD? Why? KRD? Oh, well, KPD wasn't FDA approved at the time of the study, but KRD was. It was approved in 2015. Why am I not allowed to give KRD? Hmm, interesting. What about these regimens? Ixalendex has a failed overall survival in a randomized control trial in the relapse refractory setting, which I believe is tourmaline MM1. Lovely name. Ixa, it turns out, is one of the shittiest drugs in myeloma. Even when they ran a maintenance study against nothing, which was an unethical control arm, they still couldn't even get an OS benefit. And they couldn't even get an OS benefit in the relapse refractory setting. It is really a shitty proteasome inhibitor. It's oral, it's convenient, but it's shitty. It doesn't improve your survival. So why the hell would I even want it? It should be revoked. It's a useless product. Nobody likes it. No KPD, no KRD. There's no excuse that anyone can think of why they didn't allow KRD in this study. And also, they should have allowed whatever the doctor wanted to give, for Christ's sakes. What about Cytoxin? What about Derakady, Isakady, CD38KD? You're not allowed to give a CD38KD? It's also a bizarre prohibition. And what did people actually get? Well, they got Derapomdex, 32%. They got Derivelkadex, 5%. They got Ixalendex, 16%. Poor people. They got KD, 23%. They got Elopomdex, 23%. Okay. Did the control arm regimen have something to do with your PFS? Oh, but before that, they have a very unusual criteria in the supplementary appendix. Parents, uh, patients, not parents, patients who received DARA in combination with POM or DEX as part of their last regimen, they got to get DVD, IRD, KD, or KPD. Wait a second, that means the only thing that they can't get is DPD, but they just got DPD. So you mean to tell me, you have to tell your investigators if their last regiment was DPD, don't give them DPD, give them one of the other four. And if you got Deravelcade Dex as your last regiment, you could get DPD, IRD, KD, or EPD, but not DVD. You mean to tell me, you have to tell these people 
not to give the exact same regimen they got before. You got to spell that out. What did you think they were going to do? I mean, it shouldn't have to be stated that you'd have to be a very, very delinquent and also unethical doctor to literally give somebody the regimen they have immediately progressed on. And the same is true for the Ixal index. You can give the other ones, but don't give them Ixal index. They have to be saying it because they think people would be doing it otherwise. It does speak to the fact that, you know, when you're running a trial, you maybe they worry that they'll want to please them so badly they will get to that level. I, I, would, I wouldn't think you'd have to spell it out. And to be honest, this could all be better as well because the control arm could just be, you can give him anything you wish, anything you wish, any regimen you would give otherwise. Just do that. And when they hit four prior lines, they get I to sell. And we're not going to measure PFS. We're going to measure an endpoint that's actually useful, like PFS2 or PFS4 or OS or something useful, you know, something downstream. We'll actually answer the relevant question of where do we sequence I to sell. But instead, they have this bizarre. They're banning KRD. They're banning KPD. They're banning some of the most potent triplets on, I would say, arguably, with a convenient that the more you punish the control arm with restrictions, they're gonna do poorly. Let's talk about poorly. These are the median duration of treatment. If you got DVD, you had 86 days, my God. KD was 178 days. What would have happened if you had made it KRD and KPD options? What about Dara KD? What about Isa KD? What would have happened? Huh, it turns out that if you look at just the DPD and KD arm, of course, this is not randomized. This is just the pre-specified investigator choice from the restricted menu. The PFS is more like six months, not the miserable four months that they report. And if you were allowed to actually give a proper control arm, I suspect it would be better than that. What had they gotten before? They'd gotten all of these drugs before. Oh, wow. So giving something that operates via a different mechanism of action is better than giving all of the same drugs you've already gotten before for PFS and not even OS. I mean, okay, that's what you're gonna prove to me? Wow, they've gotten all these things. 88% got an immunomodulatory agent, 73% got LAN, and 50% got POM. Interestingly, only about 40% got that K. Imagine there were more combos you could give with carfilzomib. Dara was 95% and as expected isotuximab. Very little market share for y'all. Double class refractory, tipper class refractory, penta refractory. I don't want to scoop a paper I'm working on, so I'm not going to talk too much about how they define these refractory statuses. This is interesting. 254 people were assigned to the IDASL group, two to one randomization, 249 underwent leukophoresis, but only 225 received IDASL. That's about 80, 88%. Turns out that not everyone gets this therapy because it's not off the shelf, and a lot of people die or progress before they can get the therapy. And that's pretty terrible. And I think that's gonna be the thing that keeps this product from really, you know, really being a blockbuster class of products. A total of 254 patients were randomly assigned to the ISL group and 132 to the standard regimen. So that means this is two to one randomization, so it's 12% suboptimal. You would probably be able to shave off 60 patients if you just did one-to-one -one randomization. Why didn't they do one-to-one -one randomization well, you would say that like, look, we really wanted to make this product available to people, but that doesn't really hold, does it? Because the product is available. It's FDA approved for four prior lines of therapy, but it's also not available because you're using all the slots for your study and not actually having slots available outside of the study, which is what happened during the years in which this fell in favor. So what you're saying is you took extra 60 slots. I mean, this is a research ethics question. It was not necessary for your power calculation and you'd have been better off actually using those slots for people who were progressing after four or five or six or seven prior lines of therapy who really needed the Ida cell because there was literally nothing else you could give them. The characteristics of the patients at baseline were generally balanced in the two groups, except for black race, 7% in Ida cell group and 14% in standard regiment. Excuse me? in this modern world? I don't know what you're doing here. It's a bit unusual, a bit unusual. And the control arm, no less. Hmm, I don't like it. I mean, probably randomness, let's just say. It's randomness. 
but it is an unfortunate bit of randomness, isn't it? This ain't the 1980s, okay? This is 2023. You gotta be careful about this. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Two patients had grade five cytokine release syndrome, one after decline in organ function and one with concomitant grade five Canada-related sepsis. Hmm, grade five adverse events. That, that's not good. Grade five is death. Your product kill people. Not, not good, not good. And all the more reason why PFS really isn't an appropriate benchmark for moving it up a line or two in therapy. Here's the kicker. Your PFS was four months on standard regimen, which is really poor. And you authors try to justify why that's acceptable. They say a recent real world analysis showed that patients who had been exposed to five prior regimens within a median of no more than four years since diagnosis had a median PFS of just 3.7 months. In addition, locomotion study shows, and here's locomotion, there is a median OS of 12.6 months and a median PFS of 3.7 months. This is what they're citing. So like when you've had people progress a lot, four month PFS is not out of the question. But if you have a four month PFS, you're gonna get a 12 month OS. So in this trial, the control arm had a four month PFS. So do they also have a 12 month OS? No, at the data cutoff of April 18th, 2022, with 18.6 months follow-up, only 28% of people had died in the trial and it's not significant, they don't break it out by arm. These are patients whose median OS is gonna be in the 25 to 35 month ballpark. Just plot that curve out and extend the line. So the fact they're progressing in four months is very unusual, isn't it? And it isn't commensurate with the real world where a four month PFS is a 12 month OS. This is a four month PFS with a 26 month OS, isn't it? So your, your, your medical writer or whoever wrote that sentence is trying to sell me some bullshit because I know these patients are healthier than average and they're not comparable to that real world data set. And I know your control arm was particularly shitty and you prevented investigators from giving all of the most active regimens, including ones that were FDA approved and they did much worse than expected. In fact, I'm gonna prove yet again that they're doing much worse than expected. And you're gonna try to justify that by saying, well, they don't do that good in the real world, but in the real world, they don't live 20 plus months with 18.6 months follow-up. There'll be much more than 28 percent dead. In fact, they would have met the median because it should have been 12 months. You are playing games. I know you're playing games. I read these. I. Uh, uh, this is ridiculous. We have to have some integrity in the field, okay? This can't just be the bullshit hour in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you don't have integrity, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you... Why, who is the child who grew up to want to write authors, with, write papers with medical writers and consult for companies and forget about the patient? Forget about the question. The question is, you're using IdaCell in your clinic right now. The question is, should it be after four lines or two lines? Just think, use your brain for two minutes. Should you be using PFS as the endpoint? And the answer would be, what sense would that make? You wanna know if giving it earlier versus giving it late, let's use some endpoint downstream, shouldn't we? because it's very possible you'll achieve the same OS by reserving it for later. After all, it's a little bit more toxic. It's also possible it is better to give it up front. but how am I gonna know the difference when you design a trial like this? Why is PFS the endpoint? You know, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And who is the person who goes into the field to do these absolutely uninformative studies? More proof, more proof that they have a PFS way worse than what anyone expected. We calculate with the plan sample size of 381. The trial would have 94% power to detect improvement in PFS from nine months to 14 months. They hypothesized a nine month PFS on the control arm, which would be more commensurate with the OSs that they're seeing, but they got four. They are getting a very, very poor PFS. And the DARA VD is really, really poor, even though it is 5%. They're not giving the most active control arms and that's why they're underperforming in the PFS. Okay, conclusions. Number one, the control arm was trash. Enough of this investigator choice. Give it, an, make it, just give a fair choice, okay? Anything you want on the menu, anything you want. Not these limited menus where you've removed all the most active agents. KD had some of the longest duration of treatment. And if you added a CD38 or a LEN or a POM, it would be even longer, wouldn't it? You underperformed your own power calc. FDA approved treatments were prohibited, Kirti. The PFS was so bad, so bad. 
the overall survival was much better and discordant with the PFS. Ergo, these patients are not comparable to the registries. We've learned nothing about how to sequence the agent. You've done your study. You've deprived people who of slots. You've burnt an extra 60 patients you didn't need to. And, and we really don't know where to sequence it. Is it. Should I give it after two? Should I get it after three? Or should I, can I give it after four? Where do I sequence the A drug? We've learned nothing. It's really an uninformative study. I knew it had a PFS of something. I knew it had a PFS of nine months. Now it's 13 months. But I don't know if it's best here or best later. And everyone who's doing this study believes it has a role somewhere in the journey. The company, the investigators, they failed the patients. And the medical writer was involved in the, the cover-up. Okay, now one last thought. I mean, in the regulatory system, I imagine the way I would bring this product to market wouldn't be any of this foolishness. Number one, approving it based on an uncontrolled response rate and a DOR, that's also pretty stupid. So I would say the first study should be the company has to show an OS benefit. And it has to be, it has to be CAR-T versus a real investigator's choice. And I think you'd probably go in a penta refractory setting and you randomize people to Ida cell versus investigator choice. In those days, I mean, you could might have also been, well, let's put that aside. It would have been many of these regimens. It might have been cyclophosphamide too, which by the way has been prohibited here for no good reason. Um, I think they probably would have won. I mean, I honestly think they probably would have won in the penta refractory setting and even an OS benefit, maybe. They would have eked it out. I think it would have been more sobering, pretty small, and they would have wanted to price the product a little bit lower. And then the subsequent study that they're running, I think they should be doing in the second line. Oh, by the way, my first study, people say, oh, you're going to delay the product to market. Actually, one, it would result faster. I've proven that to you in a paper by Emerson Chen and colleagues. Two, what's the point of rushing it to market when you're, when you're blowing all your manufacturing capacity on trials like this? You're not going to be able to offer the service anyway, so we don't really need to rush it, do we? But that said, it would have been faster. I would have done that study first. Then I would have done a study after three prior lines versus after five prior lines, and the primary endpoint will be OS. And it would also result pretty briskly, actually, because three prior lines, if they're really refractory um, to three classes, they don't do well per your real world registry. Then four, I would remove all of the inclusion criteria and filters. This is a paper that we wrote in Nature Reviews Oncology about um, big pragmatic randomized trial with the ability to look for real world benefits. I would remove all those things. And I really think that it probably wouldn't be moving up a line. It probably would be in that last ditch. It has toxicity, it has delay. So when you really pay those penalties up front versus getting it on the back end, I doubt you'll be able to eke out a benefit. And then while those studies were running, teclistimab and talquitimab are gonna blow you out of the water. So that's how I would envision the regulatory process to work. I think it's been detailed in four chapters of the solutions book of the malignant. I think that the way it's actually working is this study is actually really uninformative. I mean, I'm not sure anybody is going to be able to say that because of this study, I know to give it blank because you don't know. You don't know if people live longer, live better by giving it second line, third line, fourth line, or fifth line as it was already FDA indicated. Um, I don't know what we're doing. I really don't know what we're doing in this field. I mean, you do not, do you not see? There's only one entity that is benefiting from the current trials situation, and that is the company. It's not the patients. It's not even the doctors. I mean, maybe some are benefiting with consulting payments and like the, the cheap thrill of seeing your name in print, but uh, the payments are just a tiny pittance of the actual revenues the companies are making. In fact, somebody calculated it for me, but they got a little bit scared. They want to publish the paper. Um, but the revenues are just like, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the revenue that the payments the doctors are getting just one tenth of one percent of the revenue um so they're bought off cheap all right terrible i don't know karma three myeloma bad karma i mean the real lesson is bad karma because it's bad karma to be in a field that is so exploitative of patients so exploitative that they're not they don't even ask the relevant question we're already had it approved we're trying to move it up is it better up front versus giving it on the back end it's, it has a better PFS than a restricted control arm that's omitted the best options. Bravo. The PFS underperformed even your own miserable power calculation and your little spin cycle of comparing it to the real world data is not fooling anybody who's actually intelligent. So it might be fooling a lot of people. Okay, on that positive note, we'll be back. Plenary session podcast, more to come. I think, um, oh, 
develop drugs. There's a new Substack. It's called developdrugs.substack.com. If you're out there and you work in pharma, if you are out there and you work in academia, if you're out there and you're aspiring drug development person, you want to subscribe to developdrugs.substack.com. This is going to be the go-to place for drug development tips and pearls. If you like this video, if you like this explanation, if you like a clear, direct, concise, and yet also technically accurate and supported by empirical data, approach to drug development, you're going to like that Substack. So go there, subscribe, put your name on that. And if you haven't already, leave a review on the Plenary Session Podcast iTunes store. Uh, read the book Malignant. So that's what I'm telling you is a little bit repetitive and not all always out of the new. Um, and uh, we'll be back. There's something else. Oh, I want to talk about that neoadjuvant Pembro versus adjuvant Pembro melanoma study, phase two. We'll be back. So until next time.